My first impression of Judge Marshall began when I interviewed with her for the, uh, the position of her law clerk. Working with a new federal judge struck me as being uh, uniquely exciting, and working with a woman judge, there weren't very many. So over time, I watched her go from the new judge on the bench to someone who was being honored by one bar association after another. She has a keen sense that she was given an opportunity as a presidential appointment for life to make sure that what she did and what she stood for was of use not only to the participants in the legal matters before her, but also to her family and to her community. And what you get in Connie Marshall or Consuela Marshall is a very whole person, aware of her past, aware of her present, aware of what she stands for for the future, aware of the law job that she does and the family job that she does. And when you work for her, you take all that into account and you say, I want to be like that. I would characterize her career as being a woman of first. She is so modest. Not only was she the first African-American woman or judge of color appointed to the bench in California, but she was the first African-American woman and judge of color appointed west of the Mississippi. That's 24 states. She is thrilled and feels blessed to be the first, but she doesn't want to be the last. And she's actually made it a point in her career to help so many others. And I call her a stand-up woman for her family, for herself, in the many communities that she served. And certainly she stands up for equal justice and justice for all. I had the privilege of serving as Judge Marshall's law clerk for close to three years when she was chief judge. I think the complexity of Judge Marshall is probably noted in her background and experience and accomplishments in her, you know, experiences as a young woman living in segregation and then coming through law school and just the complexity of the road she traveled. I think of her as someone who has probably as much grace as anyone I've ever known. You see it in the way that she conducts herself in the courtroom, the way she treats litigants and parties and defendants and she treats all of them the same. You see it in her chambers, the way she interacts with her clerks and with her staff and with anyone who comes through the door. Connie Marshall's contributions uh, to women in the law has been uh, not only that of a role model, but of, of, a, of a cheerleader for uh, women to progress. She just devoted her life to uh, pursuing justice and She's courageous in, uh, in her decision-making. Her demeanor is always professional, and her compassion is always evident. You know, I, I don't know anybody who um, would be better named for this award than, than she. Oh, she's absolutely a trailblazer, and, and she's shown it. Uh, you know, while she's small in stature, she is a giant. And she is such a part of our recent history. It's just very meaningful, I think, um, to embrace that kind of history. It's recent history, and it's important for all of us. Good afternoon. There used to be a television program called Queen for a Day. <laughs> and my mother was one of the queens. We were so excited for her. She was excited. And now today, today I know how she must have felt. What books did you read growing up that influenced your career path? Think about it. I was asked this question a few weeks ago and I gave it some thought. And I realized that most of the books that I read in elementary and junior high school are stories of women or girls who had adversity in their lives but achieved their goals in spite of it. Books like A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, Little Women, Anne of Green Gables, and a girl of the limber loss. These books encouraged me to pursue my goals. But there were also people in my life 
who I met along the way that influenced so many of my decisions. My fourth grade teacher who reminded me I had a voice and she encouraged me to use it. Judge Constance Baker Motley, the lone woman on the Thurgood Marshall Civil Rights Team, litigating cases in the South. What courage, what inspiration. Elaine Jones, former director and counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, who knew that Elaine was knocking on doors in Washington, talking to senators about so many of us who were awaiting the confirmation process. Judge Vano Spencer, the first woman of color to be appointed to a judgeship in the state of California. I was a young lawyer who appeared in her court and she invited me into chamber after my appearance. She just wanted to meet me. She became that person for so many of us who called us and told us things that we should be doing, organizations that we should join, the next opportunities that were available to us, and we all said you could not say no to Vano. <laughs> she and Justice Jones Klein, another recipient of the Margaret Brent Award, recognized the National Association of Women Judges, and many of you are present in this room today. We were all excited that day of our first meeting. And out of that grew the International Association of Women Judges. Chief Judge Emeriti Mary Schroeder on the Ninth Circuit, another recipient of the Margaret Brin Award, knew that I had wanted to be a member of the Pacific Islands Committee for a number of years. She appointed me a member and then made me chair. That gave me the opportunity to do judicial training in other places of the world. Judge Margaret McEwen, who is here today, another recipient of this award, is now chair of that committee. Ann Williams, recently retired from the Seventh Circuit and also a prior recipient of the Margaret Brin Award, gave so many of us through her association with Just the Beginning Foundation an opportunity to give back to high school students by spending a week with them in our chamber. I am also inspired by my law clerks. They are bright, hardworking, and dedicated to the rule of law. Many of them were born in other countries or their parents were. I've learned so much from them about their cultures, their history, their adversities, and that has helped me understand the litigants who appear in my courtroom. They also provided diversity in my chambers. They made wonderful decisions in their careers and still contribute uh, to the rule of law. I am so proud of them, and many of them are here today, so I am going to ask the law clerks to stand for recognition. So I call them my children-in-law, <laughs> but of course I have another family. My husband George and I met while we were law students. We married while we were law students. We've made all of the important decisions of our lives as a couple. Not only has he encouraged me and supported me, but he's also been that person who made it possible for me to balance my career and family. We have two children, Michael and Lori, they have inspired me with their career choices. If I asked Lori today what her favorite book was as she was growing up, I believe she would say, when I'm in charge of the world. <laughs> there are other family members today and I am so pleased that all of them are here. Also my judicial assistant who's been with me over 20 years 
and I often say, how could I do the job without her? I thank all of you for your continued support and inspiration. And finally, I thank the Commission on Women for this honor. Adding my name to the list of impressive and outstanding women who have been recipients of the Margaret Brin Award on whose shoulders we have all stood. Thank you.